Touch my hair. Touch my hair. Oh! It's katana. katana. The, how, yeah. how long it takes you to do that? How long? How, no, how much time? How much time? Uh, 20 minutes. Okay, it takes me 20 minutes to do my hair too. Yeah, yeah. The adventure continues. I've had so much fun in Malaysia. Now it's time to board a plane and fly to Tokyo. All bags are belong to us. But before we leave for Japan, let's talk about what I do to pack for transcontinental trips like these. So usually what I do is I pack most of the bulk of the camera gear inside of a fairly small backpack. Second thing I do is I put everything else in sort of a support laptop bag. So this is all the laptop stuff. My passport can sit in here and anything else that I need for quick access. One can go in the overhead, one goes under the seat, and anything I'm gonna need during the flight, anything important, my iPad to watch Netflix, stuff like that, it's all right here and in easy access. Another rule is don't check anything that you're worried about getting broken or damaged. So we're traveling with a bunch of cameras, we have drones, we have different batteries. So absolutely all of the cameras, all of the lenses, and all of the batteries come with us. Even if battery chargers and different support elements like tripods and everything else go inside the bag that goes under the plane, we must absolutely never check any batteries. The biggest concern when you're traveling with a bunch of photographic gear is getting it on the plane while there is still overhead bin space. So this is where it really comes down to the boarding order or your zone, your boarding zone. What you need to do is arrive at the gate early and at least get to the front of the end of the boarding zone so that you can get on as soon as possible. If the airline offers an early boarding option and it's an additional amount of money, it's worth that small upgrade to be able to get in a higher priority line. But what if you're in a situation, you don't have any of that, it's a different airline, you had to book it late, and you're in zone triple Z, end of the world, end of the universe kind of situation. So if you're very polite in any situation you get into, in any airline travel, just be very polite and say, this is a very expensive bag full of delicate electronic equipment. Is there any way you could stow this in the coat closet for me? And I guarantee if they're in a good mood and you play your cards right, it's likely they're gonna do it. Most often, I'm only packing my own camera gear, which is fairly simple. Traveling around the world while being filmed the entire time is a new logistical challenge for me. It's definitely been a team effort to transport this much gear from place to place. We arrived in Tokyo fairly late and pretty much immediately went to the hotel and crashed. The next morning, we started off bright and early by hitting the subway. Subways are super efficient. Trains as well here in Tokyo. For example, to get to our destination would have cost me $35 for a taxi and only shaved two minutes off the trip. This is $2. Hear that? Near silence and some bird chirping sounds to calm people down even more. Japan and uh, Tokyo is a really good example of this where you can actually take a nap on the subway. Everybody's really quiet. People are just listening to their headphones. Everybody's respectful of your personal space and nobody's gonna steal. That just doesn't happen here. So you can be totally relaxed in these environments, unlike other parts of the world where the metro stations are really chaotic. Here in Japan, it's very polite. So everybody always exits the train first. Nobody, or very rarely, does one person get on before everybody exits. When you're on the escalator, best thing you do, move to the left because people are often in a hurry and they need to be able to get by. The other thing is you have to check your direction. So I already know it's platform three, but I know that's the direction. So you can see all of the stations you're going to. It's always good to double check the Google Maps just in case. Here you can see all the exits, A1, A2, B1. I chose A3, we're going to Kiyosumi Gardens. There are a lot of gardens in Tokyo, but this is by far one of my favorites. So we have to go this way, then this way, then this way. Follow that bike. An adult ticket to Kiyosumi Gardens costs 150 yen. The park used to be privately owned by the founder of Mitsubishi, who renovated the space to make it look more like a garden from Japan's Meiji era. The gardens are open to the public and are famous for their stepping stone paths. These stones are brought in from all over Japan just for this garden. Japan's predominantly a Buddhist country, so in different types of Buddhism, meditation is important. Meditation can help create harmony and balance in your life. So sometimes, in a form of meditation, I'll sit in a beautiful place like this and just relax. And in the Japanese culture, they do what's called forest bathing, 
or nature bathing. And that's the act of simply being in nature and relaxing. So throughout Tokyo, you're gonna find shrines, parks, and different nature areas that you can enjoy. And Kiyosumi Gardens is my favorite garden. Usually this one's a little off the tourist track and so quiet, even at peak times. And people just sit, relax, and enjoy it. And throughout, you can even see that we're surrounded by taller buildings, but it's totally peaceful here. Well, I feel pretty refreshed. I feel like I've bathed in the nature. Now, it's time to get into the city. I'm in Tokyo, busy rush hour commute time, heading to Shibuya Crossing which is also the busiest pedestrian crossing in the world. It's also very difficult to photograph, but I know a spot. Let's just say that Shibuya Crossing is a little intimidating to say the least because it is super busy. It's also interesting that all over the world we try to avoid crowds like this, but here in Shibuya, the crowd is literally the attraction. I gotta get a photo with this guy. Can I take a photo with you? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, this way. Oh, yeah. This is better because that's in the background. Yeah, so we go here? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ready? Ready? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Touch, touch me, okay? Yeah? Touch my hair. Touch my hair. Oh! That is katana. katana. How, yeah. how long it takes you to do that? How long? How, no, how much time? How much time? Uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Okay, it takes me 20 minutes to do my hair too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. I would really consider this sort of the Times Square of Tokyo because there's billboards, signs, there's big video screens, really just trying to draw attention to all the businesses, the bars and the restaurants around here. Because all the tourists do come here, the businesses have kind of taken advantage to market to everybody. What I usually do is I start here at the JR line and I cross and believe it or not, I go right to the Starbucks coffee. In equal parts, I always try to avoid both crowds and Starbucks coffee. But in this case, I have to combine these two things together to get the photograph. These days, it's easy to upload videos just like you'd upload photos to social media. And sometimes the algorithms actually favor videos and more people will see it. With time lapses, it's better to let it run longer. So what I'm gonna do is try to capture a few cycles of the people and then the cars and then the people again. Let's see how that turned out. There was a little bit of camera shake, but the iPhone fixes that. We get the cycle, the cars, and then the people. A photo works really well, but you really want to capture all of the chaos. And the time lapse definitely shows the amount of people that are moving through this intersection. Next on the agenda is a trip to Fujifilm headquarters in Roppongi to meet with a very special person. Now, I'm really excited we get to meet Sam Minami, who's been with Fujifilm for a long time and was responsible for the development of the Fujifilm film stock. Not only that, he built the bridge between the analog side and the digital side and is responsible for how the film simulations and new digital cameras perfectly match the original film stock. So Sam, how long have you been at Fujifilm? Um, nearly 50 years already. 50 years? That's incredible. How did you start at Fujifilm? Uh, I started my career with the technical stuff of uh, development. The film that we're all used to, or I'm all most used to, would be some of these, actually. Yes, especially this one. But we have a long history uh, with the color film. It's interesting now when we start moving into film, into the digital side. Yeah. Because now, what I, what I love is that these, mm -hmm. these films mm -hmm. are now film simulations. I feel like this is a tremendous amount of work and effort to make sure that a film look and style and color and the profile perfectly matches mm. what then becomes the digital yeah. simulation. Mm. How, this must have been a, a yes. tremendous amount of work. Yeah, and then uh, the, actually it um, sounds not very difficult uh, just measure the uh, color of, uh, on the film. 
then just to transfer to the... <laughs> right, almost like you pick up <laughs> yeah, Pantone yeah. color, yeah. it's not that easy. Mm. I wanted to continue the conversation with Sam, so we went to the Photo History Museum, which is located on the first floor of the Fujifilm Tokyo offices. Did you have a favorite camera? Uh-huh. This one. Oh, yes, the TX1. Mm. We just used one yeah. of these in Singapore. So, but this is the panoramic. Yes. Yeah. Mm. It's uh, changeable. Have you seen the exhibition of uh, Sakura Blossom? Most of the uh, picture taken by the Belvia and the Pluvia. Really? Mm. So it's not digital? No. Wow. So Sakura and Mount Fuji. I would have just assumed walking into this gallery and not reading it that it was all shot digital. Mm. So the paper actually can help too because the, the gloss gives oh, it yes. that sheen. Yes. And the Velvia tonality is really beautiful, especially mm. this is I've always noticed with the Velvia. It's, yeah. it's perfect yeah. for the yeah. for the reds mm. and the magenta. Yes. It's very difficult to reproduce with other film. And this is interesting too, we talk about color or the, the concept of actual color and memory color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because Fujifilm spent a lot of time studying how, mm. how mm. we remember yes. color. Yeah. So is that how the, the colors are represented in the film? First of all, this Velvia film, we aim to produce better color on uh, the nature scenery. Our, you know, evaluation of color is uh, not a measurement, but the shooting. Mm. And then we just observe on the uh, right works. And then we try to simulate. It's actually very, very difficult. It it's is an, extremely mm, difficult mm, to do. Mm. As soon as you start getting into the printing, mm. then there's the calibration of the inks yeah. and everything coming into it as well. Well, thank you very much for you. spending time with me this afternoon. You're welcome. Yeah, it's great to meet you too. Thank you. After seeing all these beautiful photos in the gallery, I was ready to take some of my own. I met up with Kenji Yamamura, a good friend and fellow landscape photographer near Tokyo's super luxury neighborhood of Ginza at the incredibly picturesque International Forum building. We are actually in the middle of Tokyo. But this is meant to be sort of a architectural like a architectural, yes. concept area. Concept, yes. All right. Well, let's go ahead and check it out. Yes. All right. Let's go up. So this is a cool spot because I don't think many photographers coming internationally know about it because it's, yeah. it's kind of hidden. Well, this is the Tokyo International Forum. Forum, building. yeah. Or as I call it, the spaceship. Yes. The ceiling is very interesting. Everything's interesting about this building. Do you know there's a one spot that you can take a reflection? I don't know that spot. You're going to have to show me that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I remember looking for it. I was like, I was looking at the photos. I'm like, really I don't. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I have to see this because it's like a specific area. All right, we're gonna learn this reflection spot. This, this is this has tricked me for years. I looked for this. Seventh floor. Do you? Yeah. Thank you. So this is just incredibly interesting area to photograph. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what kind of camera you have, it's a smartphone, wide angle, telephoto, mm. these bridges yes. and everything. Even the incredible. smartphone, you can take a nice one. Yeah, and what we're gonna wait for is right now the sun's getting really low, we're getting really nice light, uh -huh. but there's a lot, of, a lot of illumination inside of this building, mm -hmm. and we'll start to get the blue hour and the sunset together, yes. and it's just gonna light up beautifully. And actually the sky's perfect for it, because we're just gonna get this yes. clear, blue, clear blue, clear sky. Yes. Yeah, so reflection, the only reflective thing I see is this, which is not reflecting the scene. <laughs> I know you're laughing already, but it really can't just be, right? Yeah, it is. It's this piece of glass. Yes. So if we can get our camera yes. close enough <laughs> to this piece of glass, yeah, right. it's a perfect mirror of the scene. And it's like probably gonna be an iPhone shot. Wow, look at that. Clearly, Kenji came prepared. I have a clamp, but it's not gonna work. And, uh, so what I need to do is get really close here. And if I do this, I, I, could just, I can literally just carefully put the camera down. The, the camera's rotated down because it's just sitting on the lens. So I might be able to raise the lens up a little bit using this lens hood, but I was thinking I could just use other things in my bag, like a spare battery. So maybe very carefully, because I do like my camera and I don't want to mess it up. I can raise this up and it looks like that's a little better. So these lines are touching the bottom right corner mm -hmm. and I want, but I want it to go up a little bit more. 
It's 500 yen. You have money. I have money. <laughs> what do you think of that's like? Four degrees? Maybe each coin is one degree. That's very nice. It's adjustable. Yeah. <laughs> yen, Japanese yen to the rescue. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah, I think I need good. one yeah, more one coin. More. Yes, one more. One more. <laughs> I don't know if this is a professional photographer thing. <laughs> I think this is. Could I take the shot handheld? It's yeah. Contingency plan. The contingency <laughs> plan. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. I got it right. Yes, you got now it. the question is, that camera's not cheap. Do you think it's safe? <laughs> Not really. Not really. Not really. <laughs> I would rather you say, reassure me, like, yes, yes, I think it'll be okay. Yeah, like, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Because if it falls, it would fall here. Yeah, fall. And then I'd just have to be faster than... Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yeah. And it's a good thing that I've already trained as a ninja. What, what are we going to call this technique? Oh. I feel like it needs a good name. It could just be like battery and <laughs> coins under the lens to get the reflection trick. <laughs> That's too long. <laughs> the money shot? Money shot. I That's feel like it. somebody's yeah. used that money before, shot. maybe. After I got my money shot, Kenji and I spent more time exploring Ginza. We even ducked into my favorite sushi restaurant to eat some sashimi and discuss the Japanese mindset to photography, and specifically, Sha Shin. But that's too much for this episode. It's long enough already. So I put the extended interview with Kenji in our Flickr Moments in Time community. Be sure to check it out there, and also don't forget to give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. But before I go, one last thing. Well, I might as well show you my room. Comes with a humidifier, a bed, and a little space to move. Glasses, cups, safe. You also get, it's not a toilet, it's a washlet. Heated seats, all the bidet features. Just don't go pressing buttons until you figure out what they are. That's a big mistake. No demonstrations? No. 